Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to welcome everybody to a uh, special episode of the Life Hub podcast. And, uh, you know, we are all feeling somewhat isolated. And so it feels good to be able to connect with many of you, at least on this platform. And many of us, we have our lives disrupted and we are unable to enjoy many of the freedoms that uh, we have previously benefited from. And uh, for many of us, we have at least found solace and comfort that we are able to go outdoors, we are able to enjoy a breath of fresh air and get some exercise. And so I want you to imagine that uh, you are able to just right now go out, uh, feel that sweet breeze uh, filling your lungs, the warmth of the sun hitting your face, and you maybe you feel at peace and uh, you go and you start enjoying uh, the earth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided for us. And then as you begin walking and then running uh, to ex truly experience this freedom, uh, two figures, uh, menacing figures in a pickup truck uh, come and flank you brandishing firearms uh, you attempt to avoid them they cut you off you struggle against their weapons and they cut you down with their bullets what became an exercise of freedom deserving to all of humanity ended in confinement in a grave in a needless tragedy this uh, is what happened with Ahmad Arbery. He was simply enjoying the freedoms that we take for granted. He was just simply enjoying many of the small things in life that uh, we may take for granted or we actually are more grateful now because of the isolation and the restrictions that we have felt for so many weeks. But on February 23rd, uh, he was gunned down, jogging, he was unarmed, uh, and uh, forever uh, his life not only was altered, but that of his family and those people who were close around him. And uh, who perpetrated the crime? Two men, George McMichael, 64, Travis McMichael, 34, his son. And the senior McMichael, uh, he was actually a former uh, investigator for the district attorney. And when they had initially called 911, you know, they were actually the ones that called 911. These two men that had gunned him down, brutally murdered him. They actually uh, claimed that it was a burglary. This was someone who was burglarizing the neighborhood. And uh, they said that he had attacked them. He was the one who was the attacker. An arm, unarmed man, jogging, no weapons. Uh, they were th threatened, they were fearing for their life. And that's why brandishing guns, uh, being in, in the protection and the comfort of a pickup truck, they felt the need to chase him down and gun him down because they were so fearful of their life. Now this happened uh, February and only last week, only last week, May 7th, Thursday, May 7th, uh, were those men arrested. Now, uh, I had a very uh, interesting and illuminating podcast with Sheikh Dawood Walid last week, and I posed to him the question. I said, in your lifetime, do you feel that things have changed? Have they, gone, have they become better for the African Americans? Have they become better for black people? Or have they become worse? And uh, he said it's the same. 
you said it's the same. Nothing has changed except for the date. Uh, his grandparents felt racism. Uh, his uh, parents felt the, that same taste. And uh, he, as well as experienced uh, racism. How come there hasn't been any real changes? Why hasn't there been any real changes? The laws have changed. Uh, you have many policies that have changed. Uh, you have many laws that are in the books that have changed. You have constitutional amendments that have been added. So the constitution itself has been changed. Why has nothing really changed and the culture has relatively remained the same? Yes, for some, it has become better. It has become better. You do have people who are privileged now who have uh, a lot of material wealth. And they have perhaps um, a lot of adulation within the country as a whole. But why hasn't things fundamentally changed for the masses of people? And in some cases, it has become worse. And one of the things that we can see uh, as a reflection of that is that true, you have slavery abolished. You have the abolishment of slavery. But now you have this evolution of mass incarceration. And so you have two million people incarcerated. The United States leads the world in incarceration. And in the past 40 years, think about this statistic. In the past 40 years, they've had a 500% increase in the amount of people that have been incarcerated. This constitutes 25 percent of the world's prisoners now who constitutes the vast majority of those prisoners black men aged 18 to 35 the prime years when you establish your life when you're learning when you're growing when you're supposed to be starting a family when you're supposed to be laying down roots when you're supposed to be building the foundation for your communities these men are incarcerated you know when th with this latest pandemic we see further disparity within the african-american communities although they make up 13 percent of the population uh triple that for the percent of covid deaths in the country uh, we in Canada have our issues as well black people uh, have stated and according to uh, investigation by the Toronto Star are more likely to be stopped by the police than white people if we reflect upon the Quebec massacre the Quebec City mosque massacre the worst mass murder to take place in a house of worship in Canadian history. This occurred on our, our soil. Uh, and there was a lot of racial rhetoric that went behind that massacre. Uh, and if we look at the statistics in terms of hate related crime against Muslims, between 2012 and 2015, it has grown by 253%. I want you to think about that. 253%. Police reported uh, general hate crimes. So general hate crimes. So this is not Muslims. Muslims have a 253%. Generally, that means uh, to black people, Jewish people, it has risen by 50% for an all-time high. 
but man, we have so many laws. We have so many policies. We have so many hashtags that show us how we are supposed to be progressing, how we are supposed to be an equal society, how we are supposed to be more respectful for one another. In my lifetime, I can say for a clear fact experientially that I have felt Islamophobia increase and become worse and more pervasive. Actually, I never experienced Islamophobia very much really growing up. I felt uh, maybe as a minority, I felt it to a certain degree, uh, a little bit of stereotyping levels of racism. But and we didn't even have a word for people uh, hating on Islam. We didn't have a word for people specifically uh, targeting Muslims. Uh, it was just simply, OK, this person's a little bit intolerant. This person's ignorant or this person has some racist tendencies. But we never went around saying this person is Islamophobic. This has only come to pass within uh, the last you know, 10 to 15 years. Uh, this term that we start uh, seeing within our communities, Islamophobia. So why why has it become so much more worse when we are supposed to be more enlightened, we're supposed to be more educated, we're supposed to be more interconnected, uh, more than any time in history. There's so much information, there's so much sharing of technology and so forth. So we want to discuss that today. We want to discuss why it has become so prevalent and these laws and these policies and these woke hashtag messages aren't doing enough and will never be able to do enough to solve this problem of racism. It will never be uh, possible unless we take a radically different approach, a radically fundamentally different perspective on this issue. Now, wait a minute. Isn't racism uh, prevalent in every society? Yes. Yes, it is. Racism is prevalent in every society. It's prevalent in the United States. It's prevalent in Canada. Uh, it's uh, if you look at some of the genocides that have occurred in modern history. You look at the Rwandan genocide, the Hutus uh, committing a massacre against almost over 800,000 Tutsis within a span of a few months. On the outset, uh, it would look like maybe these people are very similar in race. Why is that racism so brutal. If we look at the Holocaust, many of these Jewish people who died in the Holocaust were neighbors to these German people. And many, there was interconnected marriages that occurred. And yet you had a brutal program of genocide that occurred against them. Uh, from a person outside looking in, these people may be neighbors, they may be interconnected, maybe very closely related when it comes to race. What about the genocide in Bosnia during the Bosnian War? Where, again, many instances, many narrations of people marrying amongst each other. And yet... Uh, a brutal war and genocide to occur. And today, from the outset, if you look at the Indian subcontinent and you look at some of the oppression that is happening in Kashmir specifically and to the Muslims generally in India, uh, you would say, hey, these are all people East Indian. Here in North America, you would be considered East Indian. No one's going to say, oh, you're from for the Hindu, you're from this caste. Or they would say to a Muslim, oh, you're Muslim and you're Hindu. Okay, I'll be less racist against you. It doesn't work like that. They were killing Sikh people after 
9-11 in the United States. They were harassing Sikh people in their temples here in Canada because they thought they were Muslim. They don't care if you're a Muslim. They don't care if you're a Sikh. They see brown. They see brown and they see a turban. But yet these people uh, whose race would seem very, very similar, uh, they are so hateful to one another. Now, one thing that can be shown with this is that religion can be racialized. A person's religion can be racialized because you have, of course, uh, you have woke people amongst racists, by the way, too. They, they're trying to uh, get you woke for their racist ideology, and they try to justify their racism by saying, or their Islamophobia by saying, you cannot be racist to a religion. A religion is an idea, okay? Uh, and so uh, they used uh, this line of argumentation, but uh, it can be r racialized because you can ascribe uh, deter discriminatory attitudes um, on a group of people by consolidating a diverse population into a monolithic person whose nature and existence is adversarial and threatening to your own. So yes, you can racialize somebody, but I feel from an Islamic perspective that tribalism is a better word. Tribalism, I believe, is a better descriptor. Uh, maybe uh, if you were looking at it from an English language perspective, maybe chauvinism may be included in there as well. But tribalism... Uh, is a form of uh, what I would say uh, racializing people by creating a group for yourself. So you have a group, a tribe I think is a better descriptor because most people in a tribe look the same. Most people in a tribe look the same, they think the same, they have the same values. And one of the main objectives of that tribe is self-preservation. And if that tribe feels that it's preservation, that its quality of life or its uh, existence is being threatened, they will do whatever it takes for that tribe to survive. And if we look at the hadith of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, he defined it uh, by saying that uh, whoever is killed under the banner of blind following, who calls to tribalism or supports tribalism, then he has died upon jahiliya. He has died upon ignorance. And so I believe tribalism is a much better descriptor, much, much better descriptor. Because guess what? You can be racist against your own race. But perhaps you'd ascribe or your loyalty lies with another tribe. That's why I like the word tribalism better. And it can be in all sorts of different uh, levels and forms. I remember once a Pakistani brother uh he wanted to marry this uh, Afghan sister, and so he would he would say how much disdain he had for Pakistani culture, and he didn't want to marry a Pakistani girl because he says, "Oh, there's so many problems associated with this culture," and there was a reason behind that, right? Because he wanted to marry this Afghani girl for whatever reason, and so there was some type of interest. There was some type of individualistic interest that caused him to leave perhaps the Pakistani tribe and go to the Afghani tribe, okay? So uh, when they say you're trying to find um, the motivation or the reasoning uh, behind why some polit politicians do what they do, they say, follow the money. Uh, in this case, for this brother, you just had to follow the laddu, okay? So as long as you follow where this 
uh, marriage suite is, okay, this very famous suite that's used in marriage, uh, then you'll find out the reason why he wanted to be part of this Afghan tribe. Uh, this can be far more insidious when, uh, you know, the life of a race or a tribe is at stake. So, for example, a Max Noman, uh, who was Jewish, supported the Nazi party. So he, he there is somebody who actually a Jewish person is known. Uh, he had an organization, League of National German Jews, where he supported that. And that's obviously a lot more insidious because that Nazi party would go on uh, to kill millions and millions of his own race. Okay. So uh, tribalism, I believe, is a much better way of describing it. You know, especially if we look at Islamic history and we see uh, how hypocrites have caused the greatest amount of damage to not only their own ethnicity, like Abdullah bin Ubay, uh, or, uh, but also the religion, right? Because he is also somebody who claimed to be a Muslim. Now, there are levels to this, of course. There's levels to this uh, racism and tribalism. Not all of it is bad. I want to say this from the outset. Not all of, of being proud of the virtues or the idiosyncrasies of your culture, uh, of where you're from, uh, of uh, your your people is a bad thing. You know, uh, I, I don't think that's uh, an appropriate thing to say when people say, I don't see color. I don't see white and black. I don't see um, uh, Chinese or Arab. I don't see different ethnicities. No, it's, you know, uh, like if, if uh, Arabs say that in our culture, we're very, very generous and they're pride, uh, they're, they're, they're proud of that then what's wrong with that? If Italians say, oh, we're a very affectionate culture, what's wrong with that? If, you know, the Chinese say we're very, very respectful to our parents, what's wrong with that? They say this is part of our culture, what's wrong with that? Uh, it was asked uh, to our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, so the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, O Messenger of Allah, is it part of tribalism that a man loves his people? And the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, rather it is tribalism that he supports his people in wrongdoing. Uh, and so that is the jahiliya, the ignorance that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam warned us about. Because he has other narrations where he has praised the people of Yemen, for example. Our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, the people of Yemen have come to you and they are more gentle and soft-hearted. Belief is Yemeni. Wisdom is Yemeni. Well, pride and haughtiness are the qualities of the owners of the camels. Calmness and solemnity are the characters of the owners of the sheep. Okay. So he, and in another narration, he says, uh, fiqh is uh, Yemeni, Yemeni. Gentleness is among the Yemeni people. Uh, there are hadith where our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, for example, has also praised uh, the people of Medina, okay? So, things like that, this is not what we would call racism. This is not something that we would say are stereotypes that we need to uh, fight against or have uh, hashtags against and campaigns against. Uh, and it can, so we understand that uh, racism, tribalism, it can range from something that is innocuous, okay? talking about, you know, praiseworthy qualities of people or things that are somewhat stupid, but they're not so harmful, okay? Uh, and um, I remember seeing an example of that uh, when I was uh, in an airport in uh, Saudi Arabia. I saw one of uh, the people working there. So one of the locals who was working there, he... Uh, people would come up to him asking him questions. And so I saw a few guys come up to him, a few, few uh, 
uh, either uh, they looked uh, as if they were East Indian or Middle Eastern. These a few men they came up to him and they asked him a question and he you could see just by his body language is brushing on the side. It's like I don't know, go go away. You know, I don't know, go away, brush aside. And I'm sitting there, I'm waiting. I was like sitting there waiting. I was ten hours. You become very, very observant watching human nature and how people behave and interact. And you see some of the, uh, you could say, um, whether it's the tribalism or the racism or the stereotyping that people have uh, in their nature come out. So here he's just like treating people that are maybe close, closer to his own, even his own race, uh, treating them very bad. Get away. Get, go, go, go. And then this um, white girl comes up it's an international airport right so people you know flying from all over the world so this white girl comes up to him and this big smile comes on his face and now he's willing to answer every question that this girl has and being very very friendly and his whole demeanor and his whole body language uh changes okay so you can have something uh stupid again right something like this follow the lead do okay and then you could have something that becomes a little bit more dangerous. So you can have something range from being really innocuous uh, and stupid to something that can be very, very de dangerous. And so this tribalism, this racism becomes problematic when you start to de dehumanize people, when you start to uh, categorize people as being inherently flawed or evil and a threat to your quality of life or existence okay so we actually have an example of this uh in the first story of humanity the first story of humanity is a very good example of tribalism of racism or this dehumanization when Iblis uh, saw Adam, السلام, and when he was asked why you did not prostrate when you were commanded to do so, what did Iblis use as an excuse? He says, I am better than him. I am made of fire and you created him from clay okay so what did he look at he looked at something that was innate to adam salam. something he has no control over allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to create him from clay allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to create iblis from fire innate something that is uh you know, he has no choice over it. It's not his actions. And that's why, for example, our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he told us in a hadith that Allah does not look at your appearance or your wealth. Rather, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala looks at your heart and your actions. Because you have a control over the state of your heart, the state of your heart. And you have a control over what you choose to do and what you choose not to do. But you have no control many times over uh, what you look like, your appearance, and even for many people, their wealth. They, they don't have really control over that. So uh, here, Iblis, what does he use? He uses something that is very innate uh, to Adam a.s. And he uses this as a reason uh, to show that he is better. He is better. So something uh, that Adam a.s. has no control over. Now, secondly, he made uh, Adam a.s. an existential threat. Not maybe necessarily to his life, but his quality of life. Okay? So he blamed Adam a.s for uh, him uh, losing his rank, his position with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he says in the Quran, so that previous 
verse that I uh, quoted was in Surah Al-Araf, and now I'm going to quote Surah Al-Hijr, Ayah 39, where he says, O oh my Lord, because you misled me, I shall indeed adorn the path of error for them mankind on the earth, and I shall mislead them all. Okay, so he wants to mislead like he was outcast. Okay, so he became outcast. His quality of life suffered. So now he wants to bring mayhem on the children of Adam and Now remember, it wasn't the existence, the mere existence of Adam and Islam that harmed Iblis, but it was the existence of Iblis's pride that harmed him. It was the state of his heart. It was the state of what he chose to do. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in Surah Al-Araf, uh, Ayah 27, O children of Adam, let not shaitan, let not the devil deceive you as he got your par parents, Adam and Hawa, out of paradise. So this is a clear warning from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was an enemy for your parents then, and he's an enemy for you today. So there's levels to this tribalism and racism. There's levels to this. And we can see that for people, it can be simply, hey, uh, I feel that, oh, this is a group of people, they're bad, they're cheap. You know, they're bad tippers, they're cheap. It can be something like that, or it can range to, this person is an existential threat to me, and I'm going to go give bomb threats to their house of worship. Or I need to go and kill as many of them as possible. How are they an existential threat to you when you feel the need to go in? But this is the psychology of dehumanization, of otherizing, of uh, con making them to be a threat to your existence in some shape, way, or form. Now, there are types that this racism can manifest itself in. It can be covert and it can be overt. So what do I mean by that? And I think many people here uh, in the West who are minorities will appreciate the challenge with covert racism. So what is covert racism? Well, covert racism is that you feel the effects of racism, but everything is checking off all the politically correct boxes. You know, it's, it's like a slow burn. You can smell it, you can taste it, but it's so hard to prove it. Because most racists aren't going to take a cross on your front lawn and start burning it and calling you racial epithets. Most racists aren't going to do that. The ones that are the most dangerous and the ones that are the most prevalent are the ones that are going to give you the illusion that you are okay, that you are safe but they're going to kill you with a thousand cuts. And this is one of the reasons why, for our listeners, I want you to appreciate why sometimes people fake racial attacks. You know, there, there is a reasoning behind that, okay? We can't just say that that person is simply seeking attention for the sake of seeking attention. For many of these people, it's because they have suffered this covert form of racism. These slights, this unfairness that they can't prove, this slow grind that uh, they feel like, unless I give you something that is really overt, okay? Unless I give you something that is like, my hijab is being pulled off and I'm getting beat up, okay? They've seen that look, man, a thousand times. And so now, to get that sympathy or to tell the world I feel that way, some of them, they do fabricate stories of 
overt racism. That this guy came in, started calling me this, that, and the other, and was pulling off uh, my hijab. You know, so you you would see people who, who would um, uh, who who would do that for that reasoning. That's that's the type of psychology that occurs. And by the way, that's not that's nothing new. That's nothing new. If you study the civil rights movement, so for example, if you study the storyline behind the protests in Montgomery, Alabama, with uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and many of the civil rights activists. What they would do is they would uh, they would want to uh, stage almost uh, the most brutal picture that could be published for mass media because they would want to uh, they wanted attention to come to their cause. And the only way really you get that attention, like because things were going by status quo. No one's really going to change the system or challenge the system or cause a revolution to the system when you have uh, the just the everyday slights or people are saying, I'm following the laws. You know, they're not allowed to come on this bus. They're not. I'm not being racist. We ended slavery years ago. And so now to change, it's still unfair, man. There's still something wrong. So to be able to change that, they had to stage it. They had to give you a clear picture why. So if you look at some of the stories, uh, a reporter actually came in to help them at, at times. Uh, if they were being attacked by dogs, he said, no, your picture, taking a picture of what's happening is more important. OK, so uh, this is one of the reasons this is how uh, the covert racism can affect the the psychology of people okay and uh and 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 it's very very sinister it's it's like this uh hidden uh cancer and i remember uh you know myself facing it i was I, as i have been born and raised in canada i've lived in three provinces in canada i've i've, I've visited almost every single province in canada i regularly travel extensively within canada and Within this country, I have experienced this this subtle, uh, this covert racism. They're not coming at you and yelling things at you uh, in your face necessarily, but when they can slight you or they can say certain things, then um, they do it. So, for example, I remember I was at a department store once, and I was in uh, the men's uh, shoe section in that department store. And so the salesman comes up to me and he says to me, out of the nowhere, like just I, I, this is one of the first things that he said to me, maybe after just saying hello. He said, yeah, you know, my uh, I have I have been here since I have generations of people living in Canada from the 1700s, something to that effect. Like, you know, we have generations of people that have lived here in uh, in Canada. And then he goes to me. It's like, when did you come here? Right? When did you come here? It's like, man, Fulan. Listen, Fulan. Fulan had been Fulan. I've been born here. Okay? I'm born here, but it's so funny that you feel the need to show that you've been here. Maybe your forefathers were part of the first colonizers. So uh, I can say I know my father's story of what, what happened when he came here. Second day when he arrived in Canada, uh, he was earning an honest living. He was pumping gas in minus 40 degree Canadian winter. He wasn't pumping out smallpox and uh, taking land away from people. So, you know, you've, you feel like I got to be on the defensive. You have to be on, on the defensive. And it's there and it's so pervasive. You talk to some of the muhajibat. You, know, you talk to some sisters who wear hijab. And ask them. How many times have you been asked. Oh wow. You speak very good English. How come you speak such good English. I can't tell you how many times. A sister in hijab. It's like really. You're surprised. You're surprised. That somebody wearing hijab can speak English.
It's like, have you just emerged from a time capsule that was sealed in 1978? Like, you're surprised that somebody can speak English besides your prototype. I remember uh, another incident to show you how it can be very, very covert and intelligent. And sometimes the ones that do the most damage are the ones that are identified as racist, but hold positions of power, of authority, uh, or have significant positions within uh, institutions, public institutions. So, for example, there is... Um, uh, a uh, a professional that I know, a health professional that I know, that told me that he was he shared a flight once, and so he's white. So this this guy that I know, he's white, and so he shared a flight with uh, a judge from Little Rock, Arkansas, and he's uh, you know he's white as well. And so this judge was flying up to Canada, so uh, you know they were they were both sharing this flight up back up to Canada, and he's going to come hunt in Canada. And so uh, he was uh, a little bit tipsy. He was he had drunk a little bit. And so he was very loose lipped in terms of the types of information that he was revealing. And he told him, he said, you know, um, the cases that I preside over, any time I see a black person in my courtroom, I give him the third degree. I give him every single uh, I, I give him the full punishment to the fullest extent of the law now he can never be accused of being racist because what's happening hey i'm just following the law listen to me man i'm not doing anything wrong i'm not racist are you telling me following the law is racist uh i remember meeting with university administration i've been a chaplain for many years since 2007 and so you meet with uh different people of uni university administration so i come in this bearded muslim guy i think i may i may have been wearing a kufi at that time i wasn't wearing the x hat and i'm coming in there and it just briefly comes out just the only part of the information that comes out i have a wife and daughters and then it's like you could see all the all the um, uh, all, all these assumptions in her mind, all these stereotypes in her mind churning. And she lets out uh, almost as a way of um, uh, of trying to be some type of woke hero. She says, "It's, it's such it's so crazy out of the blue." She's like, "Wow, it must be." So nice, isn't it, to be surrounded by such strong and powerful women? You know, it's like first of all, like my 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 daughters aren't women yet, okay? And uh, and it's such a weird thing to say. It's such a weird thing to say to like I said, like imagine if she's like she tells me, oh, I'm married, I have a husband, and I'm like, it must be nice you know, to have a man that shares in the household chores, you know, like, like what? It's so like, it's so bizarre, but it shows what they're thinking. Like they think a oh, Muslim guy, Muslim man, uh, he's probably super oppressive to the women in his life. And so I gotta like say something to show him that yeah, you must be nice, right, to have these strong women. Women are strong, by the way. Like, it's wh – what type of messaging are you trying to give me? I remember another time meeting with a university uh, administrator in the the medical department, the health sciences department. And I was conveying to him a concern that one of the brothers had who had an interview for medicine saying that, uh, you know, he felt uncomfortable shaking hands with women because we aren't – casually allowed to touch women in a specific health setting when there's a requirement then yeah you, you know there's a need for that but he was concerned so i was bringing this to his attention i said you know can we maybe give some training and instruction to the interviewers so that they are aware of this concept so they don't hold it against uh this particular individual and he made a huge deal about it he made a huge deal about that 
uh, you know, he uh, was saying that how can you expect to be able to practice medicine in this culture uh, by uh, by doing this, okay? Uh, by um, not shaking uh, hands uh, with people, with the people of the, uh, the opposite gender. But, you know, the question arises, by compelling somebody to shake hands with somebody, you're essentially saying that they have a right to touch your body. That's what you're saying. You're saying that that person, I don't have a right over who touches my body, but that person has a right to touch my body. And what's interesting enough to show you that this is tribalism. This is racism. Because that same university administrator who gave such a hard time and really didn't accept, uh, you know, uh, this, you know, this idea that we should be, uh, be in control of who touches us, had a daughter who uh, accepted Judaism, so they're white, okay, uh, let's, so that, to be clear, who accepted Judaism, and she said part of her religion was that she could not take part in uh, uh, dissecting cadavers in the anatomy lab. And this is a very important component of learning uh, human anatomy. And so she was able to recuse herself from that, and he supported her in that. And there was no problem with that, even though that could possibly uh, compromise patient care. But not shaking hands casually with someone in an interview um, would compromise patient care. Man, if they just took the Islamic principles, if they took the Islamic values in the rights that we have over one another, you wouldn't have the Me Too movement. There would be no need for the Me Too movement. It would be, uh, it wouldn't need to exist. And so what happens is many of these people, they apply those laws or they apply the rules differentially. They apply it differentially. And that's a lot of the covert racism that many of us face in North America. And they say, we were only following the rules. We were only following the policy. We were only following the laws. Look, this is the policy. And they point to the policy. It's easier to point to the policy than saying, hey, listen, I just don't want to see you or your kind uh, have it easy. Uh, remember, one at one point, slavery was legal. At one point in the United States, Black codes were legal. Sundown towns were legal. Sharecropping was legal. Jim Crow was legal. Racial covenants were legal. And today, mass incarceration is legal. Okay, so don't fall to that what is legal. Because with your legality... You, does not necessarily include humanity. Now, from an Islamic perspective, I want us to reflect on the ayah in Surah Al-Hajj, ayah 37, from an Islamic point of view. And I think it's a very important point of view that the world needs to know about. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it is neither their meat nor their blood that reaches Allah, but it is piety from you that reaches him. So this sacrifice, by making this animal sacrifice, you're following Islamic law. You're following the law. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator, is saying you're, the blood and meat doesn't reach Allah. That's not what that, uh, that reaches Allah, that you're just following this this rule, just like in Ramadan, Allah is not in need of your fasting if you're going to go slander uh, people and backbite and, and talk ill of, uh, of people. This is it. It is your taqwa that reaches Allah, your piety, your God consciousness, your sincerity. That's what reaches Allah SWT. 
And so you'll see many racists use facts. They say that these are facts and statistics to justify their racist beliefs. And they'll say statements like, you know, math and stats aren't racist. You know, maths and stats aren't racist. The problem is, is that you put a hood, a white hood over math. Okay. Math wasn't racist, but you then you put a white hood over math's face. Okay. How you manipulate mathematics and statistics. Yeah, that is racist. That is racist. Because think about this. Okay. Here's, here's a common racist trope. Okay. They'll say, uh, you know, I know all uh, Muslims aren't terrorists, but all terrorists are Muslim. You know, so they're they're going to use uh, this type of um, uh, you know dialogue. Okay, they're going to use this type of talking points. Okay. Well, you know, th then it's like equivalent to saying, well. Uh, not all Americans are foreign invaders, but all foreign invaders are American. You know, if you want to play that game, you know, not all white men are serial killers, but all serial killers are white men, right? Like, how do you want to, like, play this game? Like, how do you want to keep going? You know, uh... <laughs> you know, like, uh, not, uh, uh, not all atomic bombs are dropped by white men. Actually, they are actually dropped all by white men. So, like, how far do you want to go? How do you, how, I, I, like, you know, we, we if you want to play this game. And, and that's why co covert racism, I feel, is is the worst it's very insid insidious it doesn't allow a person to be sincere they hold these beliefs and then all they have to do is uh make sure okay i'm following this code and this law and i'm checking off all the politically correct boxes but you're causing a great amount of damage and that was different you know i remember as a kid growing up i felt i'd rather have you be open with your beliefs i would rather have you wear your heart on your sleeve i would rather have you uh, say uh, what you feel in your heart? And that's, I remember as kids growing up, like, you know, I, mostly around white people, but oftentimes, and, uh, you know, you have different cultures, especially in Canada. I felt it was better to have those open conversations. I remember one of my best friends growing up, the first day of school, this guy was saying all this racist stuff against me. He was saying all these racist stuff. Imagine if he kept it inside. Imagine if he kept it inside, okay? And it just was able to grow and fester. And he has says this, and I'm and I'm giving it back, okay? So I clap back at him. He's clapping at me. We're clapping back. And then we were uh, first day of school. I must have been in uh, grade uh, when we we had just moved uh, that particular um, that year. I must have been in grade five. I was walking back, and it turns out that uh, we ended up. Uh, living beside each other. This guy ended up being my my neighbor, like the guy who lived right beside me. And as we're walking, <laughs> my father and his mother were talking, like from their lawns. Okay, so let me be introducing each other. It's like, oh, hey, you guys go to the same, you know, in the same class. You guys should be friends. <laughs> and then we're like, we just had this fight, okay? But it was all out in the open. Uh, and we looked at each other and we're like, yeah. We may maybe we'll become friends, and then we actually did become friends. We became like best friends. Okay, I, I remember uh, then. So we're able to move past that. So this idea of um, always hiding things, and we have to be politically correct, and like we got to cancel people, and people can't speak. Like maybe it is like ignorance in their mind. Imagine if people during the time of our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, kept things in their heart then how would we have so much like wisdom how would we have how would we have like so much of the great hadith that we have how would you, how would we have so much of the great rulings that we have you know uh, uh, they felt safe being able to say stuff you know that youth felt safe being able to come to prophet muhammad peace be upon him and say uh 
like let allow me to commit zina, allow me to commit adultery. He felt safe coming to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to say that. And and people were safe. Uh, they felt safe talking about uh, tribalism and some of the, the concepts that they had. And then they would get this guidance with kindness and mercy and wisdom, you know. And, and that's why uh, w this is the racism that we really need to uh, approach. But the strategies are so ill-conceived because overt racism is very easy to call out. That's a no-brainer. It's very easy to prove. Um, and it's all to tell you the truth. Overt racism is usually conducted by like middle and lower class people, upper class people, people who are a little bit more educated. They know how to play the game. OK, so what's happened now in our society is that whether you have overt or covert racism, whatever is proven, the net result or the change is still the same. It's still the same. Because what we have done, even if we prove it, even if we call it out, you are uh, not solving the issue. You are not solving the issue. So whether we are, we are doing this, we're, we're, we're talking about doing woke justice uh, or we're reacting to racism, uh, we're bringing it out in the open, we are giving, uh, we're doing a rejection, but there is no proposition of how we can function better in humanity. Okay, so uh, I'll, I'll give you an example. Right now, there's a lot of rhetoric online, COVID conspiracies, tons of COVID conspiracies. Some of them, they may be realities. Okay, you know, maybe, but let's face it. Uh, again, follow the money. Uh, there's there's some self-interest for a lot of these conspiracies as well. So there's a lot of these COVID conspiracies going around. Great. Let's assume now that this COVID conspiracy is true. Let's assume that. Okay, it's true. The world finds out, yes, it's a man-made virus. Great. We've proven it. Now what? We have to fire Fauci. We have to fire, um, you know, government officials. We have to do all this stuff. People need to be fired. People need to be canceled. Okay. Now what? Um, okay. Well, we'll have our own people now run. And they will now be in charge. And they will now lead the way. Okay. Now what? As time moves on, guess what? They become corrupt as well, and they have their own conspiracies, and they have uh, their own issues to deal with. And now we have to do this cycle all over again. Okay, you didn't really change just by rejection. Okay, just by identification and this rejection. That's what kufr is, by the way. And that's if you look at the, one of the past podcasts, that's what Imam Nadwi meant. Uh, meant when he said that kufr is in a system. Kufr means to reject, right? Kufr is a rejection, is a rejection of Iman. Uh, and so rejection, re rejecting what is wrong is not necessarily a system or rejecting uh, for kufr, they're rejecting what is right. So just the act of rejection isn't a system. It's not a proposition. And so, uh, for we have this example of like the Iraq war, right? So the Iraq war, for those of you who are old enough to remember this, there was massive protests against the Iraq war. I took part in those protests. Most of the world was against the Iraq war. Most of the people were against going to war with Iraq, even in the United States. In the UK especially, one million people on the streets marching against the Iraq war. Uh, but no, weapons of mass uh, destruction. What happens? They still go to war, even though the people were against it. Afterwards, it was found out the presumption under which the war was waged was a lie. Did anything change? Did the system change? Okay, let's bring in Obama this year. 
let's bring in a Democrat this year. Did the system change? No. Actually, the system stayed intact, and now we killed. Okay, let's not go to a uh, overt war. Okay, so let's go not go from overt war, but let's go to a more covert war, a more white gloves war, where we're going to drop drone, like we're going to use drones now to drop bombs. So it's very clean, very hands off. Okay, so the. It didn't change the system. You're still getting that brutality. You're still getting massive loss of life. You're still getting now all these problems. Think about what 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 manifested from there. Okay, that Iraq war. You had uh, ISIS spawn from there. You had uh, all these civil wars spawn from there. Like just bloodiness everywhere. Okay, how many hundreds of thousands of orphans? How many millions of lives lost? Uh, from that and it was all based on a lie we proved the lie we proved the conspiracy did anything change no nothing changed so what is my radical idea what is the radical idea it's not my idea this is uh, an idea as old as adam salam and this idea was brought in its final message with Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is only really one solution. How can we expect to give the rights to others, to other people, when we don't give rights to the Creator? How are we supposed to give the rights to the creation when we don't give the rights to the one that created us, all of us. How can we humble ourselves and accept the humanity of every single man, woman, and child if we can't humble ourselves to the one that created us? We need to fulfill the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala first. He is the most deserving Azza wa Jal for his rights to be fulfilled before we fulfill the rights of anyone else. Give rights to Allah, then the creation. But it's important to give rights to the creation as well. So we give rights to Allah and then the creation. And I think this is most beautifully encapsulated in Surah Al-Taha, Ayah 43-47. to 47. So in those verses, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause and reflect because there's so many lessons that we can learn from this. Allah tells Musa and Harun, so Moses and his brother Aaron, go to the Pharaoh. Verily he has transgressed against all bounds uh, and in disbelief. Okay, so go, go to him. He's transgressed against what? Against Allah and against people. This guy was a tyrant, man. This guy was a brutal dictator. This was uh, more than how you know how those how everyone hates Trump and and and, and, and you know thinks that he's the worst uh, leader to have ever emerged. He was worse than Trump. He actually, he didn't think he was God. He said he was God. Okay. And so Allah says to his prophets and speak to him mildly. Perhaps he may accept admonition for fear of Allah. Speak to this tyrant mildly. He should be canceled. He should be shamed. He should be called out, okay? He should be told, you know, how you know how bad he is, okay? No, speak to him mildly. And I'm going to uh, put a pin in that because I want to talk about um, the what's happened now recently in the woke justice, which is not changing anything, by the way. It's not changing systems. And uh, the Islamic guidance for, for justice. So we'll put a pin in that for a minute. It says, speak to him mildly. 
And they said, our Lord, verily we fear that he should hasten to punish us or lest he should transgress against us. So he's going to, they're worried that uh, they may be harmed. So one thing that we understand to have true justice, to stand up for true justice, you need to have courage. You need to have courage. I'm sick and tired of corporations thinking there's there's somehow standing for some type of uh, just cause, or they're standing up for uh, some social issues. They're very, very intelligent. These corporations, these companies, when they have all these different ribbons and these different placards and they're saying, oh, we're standing up for this, it's very easy. It's very easy. You know why? Because they do their research and they understand that these causes are already normalized within society. They're easy wins and it's just going to be like free and uh, easy marketing. It's going to be low hanging fruit for them to just pick off and eat. OK, and at the same time, they're giving the appearance that we're contributing to the community. We care more about uh, the community rather than just dollars and cents. OK, every time I see this, I say to them, do you have the guts? Do you have the guts to stand up for the Palestinian cause? Because it's not a very popular cause. I'm sorry. Do you have the guts to stand up for something like that? For people who don't have a voice? How many of these companies um, stood up for the Rohingyans that are, are that are facing genocide? How many of them stood up for uh, over one million, three million, to many estimates, Muslims that are imprisoned? in China how many of them it's not popular right not popular but it's easy to stand up for other things that already the mass media is talking about everyone's wearing the ribbons we have massive parades uh, we have uh, you know uh, you know commercially mass produced buttons and everything that's easy to, to, to stand up for so it takes courage to stand up for what is truly just it takes courage it takes a lot of courage so um, Allah then responds to his messengers by saying, fear not, verily I am with you both hearing and seeing. So if we have Allah with us, if you believe in Allah, you fear no man and you only fear Allah, you have the courage to overcome a Pharaoh. So he says, so go you both to him. And say, verily, we are the messengers of your Lord. So let the children of Israel go with us. Okay. And torment them not. Indeed, we have come with a sign from your Lord and peace will be upon him who follows guidance. So the first thing that Pharaoh was called to was to worship Allah. Give the right to Allah. See, look at this. This is this uh, distills down to fundamental rights. Give the right to your creator. Give the right to Allah. Give the right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then give the rights to these people that you have enslaved. Let them go. Set them free. Give them their freedom. Give them their equality. Because it has to come in the proper order. If you put it out the order, you're always going to be deficient. You're always going to have some some type of a deficiency that you're going to have to fix. There's always going to be something that you're going to have to go back in and repair. If you don't put it in the proper order, if the foundation isn't based on something that is uh, solid. And that is the only way that we can create Justice. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran, in the chapter known as women, chapter 4, ayah 135. O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your creator, even though it be against yourself or your parents, or your kin, 
be he rich or poor, Allah is a better protector to both than you. So this verse, I want you to think about this. This ayah is coming to a people who were highly tribalistic. Tribalism was their mechanism of survival. Without your tribe, you're dead. So you support your tribe no matter what. No matter if your own tribe member is wrong. The tribe is a the guy is a liar. He's he is the worst human being. And we see that, right? How tribalism works. You'll support politicians. Yeah, he's uh, you know, yeah, he's sure he he says he he'll uh, he he's assaulted women and he talks about women in a degrading way and he talks about so many people in a degrading way. I don't care, he's part of my tribe, man. We've seen this before. We've seen this before in Islamic history. Look at Musayn al kadhab He was a false prophet. His tribe supported him. Why? Because he was right? Because he had real revelation? No. They knew he was a liar. They said, we know he's a liar, but I'm going to support him because he's from my own tribe. So we know, people know that, hey, I know this guy's like a disgusting, gross. This guy's gross. But I'm going to support him because he's from my tribe. I got to support this guy. You know, he's, he's, he's part of. So this is a revolutionary concept, man. This is revolutionary. You mean I have to stand up for justice. Even if it's against myself, my own desire, if it's against my own self-interest, my own political career, my own money, my own family, like all of this, I have to, I have to stand up because it's the right thing. This is the right thing to do. I have to do that. Yeah. It's Islam. When it was revealed, the this ayah in the Quran. And the Islam amongst the Arabs single-handedly ended that tribalism. And because that ended the tribalism, they were able to flourish for hundreds of years across the globe. They were able to, that's how restrictive tribalism is. It doesn't allow your society to flourish. And what we should understand is that our morality includes humanity. A lot of people's moral code does not include humanity. Our morality includes humanity for the believer and the disbeliever. If you look at Hilf al-Fadul, so this is the alliance or the pact of uh, Fadul. This is a pact that occurred in pre-Islamic times where they were, they said they would stand up um, against any oppressor, okay? So uh, they would support an oppressed person against any oppressor. Uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, uh, he witnessed this and he says that uh, if I were to call to it now during Islam, I would respond to it. Meaning that it's general rule that it doesn't matter if it's a Muslim that's oppressing, we have to stand up against the Muslim that's oppressing. If it's a non-Muslim that's oppressing, we got to stand up against a non-Muslim who, who, who's oppressing. You have to stand up for justice, even if it's against your own self. So it doesn't matter whether you are poor, whether you are rich, whether you are black and you are, and you are white. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your outer appearance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at what's in your hearts. Okay. And so this change, okay, can only occur if we can subjugate our ego. Because right now for modern society, their ego is their God. Their ego is their God. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he tells us in Surah Al-Furqan, chapter 25, ayah 43 in the Quran, you know, have you seen him who has taken his God to be his own desires? And I would say uh, atheists are the most shining example of that because they try to act like a God. They're, they, they're not even, many of them, they're, they're, they're definitely tribalistic. So they have almost like their atheist tribe. But then... Oftentimes, they even they're above their tribe. They're, they're they are their own god. So 
whatever atheists have known to do bad, they're very easy to disavow themselves from any bad atheists. Oh, no, no, just because they're atheists doesn't mean they're my brethren. But if a Muslim or some other group that they have uh, enmity towards does something, they treat them as a, like a monolithic person. They, they're not able to uh, separate themselves from the crimes of anyone else that they consider to be within this monolithic uh, individual that they've concocted. Okay. So anyhow, so the, the way we get that real change is, again, you subjugate your ego to your Lord. Okay, so you, it's not, it's, and it's not the other way around. And that's why these bully tactics don't work to bring about change. Okay, bully tactics don't work to bring about change. So we're in an era where, as I've mentioned, let's cancel this person. Let's call them out. Let's 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 hit them hard, man. Like, what do you mean, Liam Neeson, the Taken guy? He used had some racist thoughts when he was younger. Cancel him. Cancel Liam Neeson. No more movies for you. No more daughters being kidnapped for you, Liam Neeson. Right? You're canceled. So all of a sudden now, you're going to start bullying people. And guess what? What I find ironic is that historically, uh, a certain demographic of people would be uh, bullied. Okay, and you have the bulliers. So these bullies would bully, uh, you know, they'd have certain victims. But now these victims uh, have now started using the same tactics as these bullies. Okay? Calling people out, canceling them. We've got to end your life, your career, all this stuff. Let's attack you. You know, uh, no due process, all of these different things. And this just leads to a cycle of revenge. But in Islam, that is not the first, that is not the methodology that we go. Okay, that's not the methodology that uh, that we go. Why? Because when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told Musa and, and Harun to talk to Fir'aun mildly, think about the deafness, the wisdom behind this. You don't give that person's ego a chance to be an excuse for change. Because for us, our goal is that you can repent, change, and go into Jannah. You can you can make it. You can turn things around. You can come back. You can go from being horrible to coming back, and being like a leader in goodness. You can do that. That is the Islamic paradigm. That is the Islamic perspective. That is the Islamic value system. No matter how uh, bad you have become. No matter what evil you have done, you can turn that around. Turn it around. And so now my goal to get you to turn around, there's a wisdom in my approach. Because if you go to anybody and advise them in a very harsh way, I go to you like, and I, and I try to tell you to change something about yourself. Hey man, you, hey, don't you know smoking is disgusting? Huh? Why did you quit smoking? The guy's going to flick his cigarette in your face. You've hurt his pride. You've hurt his ego. Anybody that you say that to. So because Allah knows his creation, he doesn't want your ego to be an impediment. Because the goal is change. The goal is not fulfilling your ego. Or uh, ha having the other person's ego as an impediment. The goal is both of you getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Both of you becoming better. Both of you changing the system. Not just getting revenge or getting into a cycle of revenge now that's different like i'm going to say this as a caveat that's different when you are actually being bullied you're being physically threatened as many of our sisters are being physically threatened and so we need to be able to defend ourselves and sometimes when you defend yourselves uh it, that's physical that's a physical defense of yourself and malcolm x aptly put it he said self-defense isn't violence, it's intelligence. So that's, you know, that, that that's different. But we're talking about as a general rule when we want to approach people and we want to cause change uh, within uh, society, okay? So uh, I'm going to give, give you an example of this, okay? A beautiful example. Our Sira is filled with beautiful examples of how we cause change, man, real change, lasting change, societal change. It's not just, oh, 
I changed the program, I changed the channel, I changed this guy's career. No. I want to I want to talk about uh, how Abu Mahdura became Muslim. So Ab Abu Mahdura was a youth. He was a young guy, and uh, this is like in uh, Fatah Mecca. So when Mecca was taken over, our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam came. He commanded Bilal, give the adhan, go climb upon the top of the Kaaba. Bilal, being a black man, surrounded by these Arabs, goes in, starts giving the adhan. This is a bunch of youth start making fun of the adhan. Could it be racially motivated? Who knows? Could it be uh, motivated by uh, like just the fact that they were mushriki and so they were disbelievers and all of a sudden Islam now comes and Adhan is being given? Who knows? It could be whatever, Islamophobic. It could be racist. Who knows what it is? But how did the Prophet Muhammad them deal with it? Did he come them and cancel them? What did he do? Did he come and bully them? Say, hey, we took over. My military has come taken over. You give respect to my muaddin. Rasul they're making fun of the Adhan. So they're, they're, they're mimicking, mocking the Adhan. So the Messenger of Allah goes to them and says, okay, who is, you know, who is uh, the one with the voice giving the Adhan? And then one guy's like, oh, and it's like, no, no, it's not you. Let me hear the voice. No, no, it's not you. It's not you. He gets to Abu Mahdura. Right, and uh, he he says you you know he gave him a, a very good voice and he patted him on his head so he 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 touched his head in a loving way. He says, "I want you to give the adhan." What? Shouldn't he be banned from being in our community? Shouldn't he be banned from being around us? Like I think I'm getting triggered by just seeing this person's face. No. Go give the adhan. Abu Mahdura went and gave the adhan. And he became like partners with Bilal. For the rest of his life, Abu Mahdura would give the adhan. The part of his head that was touched by Prophet Muhammad وسلم, he didn't cut that hair for the rest of his life. Because the blessed hand of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, touched him. And it became a tradition in his family. Like, you know, his his children uh, would give the adhan. His grandchildren uh, would give the adhan. For centuries, it became a tradition. That act of kindness, that approach of a Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam changed the generations of Abu Mahdura. It changed Abu Mahdura's psychology. It changed the heart of Abu Mahdura. It changed his whole family lineage from, th uh, from, from then on. He became with Bilal, he became partners with him giving adhan. He became brothers in faith, true brothers in faith. You tell me why hasn't, uh, why has things remained the ch same since slavery? Because you changed the laws, but you didn't change the hearts. You didn't change the hearts of people. There's still disease hearts that need to be purified. That's that's the whole point of uh, of of turning to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala first. Wa yatlu alayhim, so uh, uh, recite onto them the ayat. Wa yuzakkiyim, so that they can. So you're purifying them with these ayat of Quran. You're purifying their hearts. So you're changing a system, you're changing the generations, you're changing the mindset. How come you could have these slave, slave owners, generations coming up, maybe their progeny still has the same mentality? Why is it that you still have like this inherited trauma? Bilal was traumatized. But why isn't his progeny inheriting the trauma that Bilal endured? Because Islam caused healing. The guidance of Islam caused healing. It was a fundamental change in people's psychology. It's a fundamental change in the system. If we look at uh, the hadith mentioned with uh, Abu Dhar radiallahu anhu. And so in this particular hadith, 
And I want to comment on this hadith a little bit because there's uh, some false narrations that are attributed to this hadith. And so I'm, I'm going to comment on that as well. But uh, there, 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 there's an argument between um, uh, Abu Dhar or you know two men, and one of them was a non-Arab. So, um, so Abu Dhar spoke ill of him in light of that, and so Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this matter was taken to him, and so Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says that did you put down that person, and Abu Dhar said yes. And so our Rasul ﷺ said, did you put him down on the account of his mother? Because his mother was non-Arab. He said, yes. He said, uh, then indeed that you still have some ignorance within you. So you have this ignorance with you. So you call that ignorance jahiliya. He called that uh, like an ignorant mindset. Okay, that he needs to get rid of. Now, the version of the hadith that uh, is... Uh, false and that's used to spice up the story and it's very common is that this occurred between Abu Dhar and Bilal and he said you son of a black woman and uh, and, and you know there is to, to add all this spice but this is all false narrations by the way so for those of us who have heard it many times that part of it is false the correct part of it is that we know generally speaking Abu Dhar had an argument with someone he disparaged that person for something that was innate about him that his mother was not Arab and so our Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam identified that by saying that uh, it is um, you know that is not the correct way uh, you know for, for you to think that is not reflective of somebody who is uh, a Muslim like in terms of like their fully understanding of being Muslim, right? Because giving that full right to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you subjugate yourself to the to the creator. And so now you are accepting of different parts of yourself that might be ignorant that you need to face. So now talking about Bilal, now I want to go back to Bilal. Let's, let's talk about Bilal. Because again, these are issues, the issues that Bilal faced, the trauma that he faced. Um, and... Uh, the challenges that he faced, many of us face today being minorities. Many African Americans face the same challenges as Bilal. Many Muslims living as minorities face the same challenges as Bilal. But look at how healing occurred. Look at how uh, tribalism was dealt with, racism was dealt with, um, you know, uh, disparity, like, you know, judging people based on their status, their material status. And so, Rasul, for example, he, 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 it was well documented, the status that Bilal had. And the Messenger of Allah testified to that. He said, Oh, Bilal, on the night of Mi'raj, I, um, I heard uh, footsteps, I, I heard your fits, footsteps rustling in Jannah. Okay, he went to the Jannah. And he's because he asked, he said, I heard footsteps, and I said, I asked Jibreel whose footsteps are these. And he says that these are the footsteps of Bilal. And then he asked him, What is the good thing that you do that you have this rank? And so he said, Oh Messenger, I fulfill uh the far deeds. Okay. I fulfill um and I have wudu. So I fulfill the far deeds and I I always try to have ablution. Okay. So again, Bilal wasn't praised because he was black, nor was he disparaged because he was black. Because then you have an extreme, right? So you have some people with that extremist view. Oh, black people, we are gods. You know, everyone comes from black people. You know, cradle of civilization from Africa. No, it, why was Bilal deserving of paradise? Bilal was deserving of paradise because of what he does. What he does not what he was innately created as. What Bilal does, and what Bilal does, is he always makes sure that he is wudu, and he is uh, always making sure that he is fulfilling the faraid. Now, Bilal, he endured trauma. Okay, So Umayyah bin Khalaf would torture Bilal. Uh, he would put these huge stones to try to crush Bilal. He would be whipped. 
He would be tortured. Uh, he would be put out in the sun. Why? Because how dare you as a, as a slave think for yourself and accept the deen of Islam when this goes against our system, our a status quo. How dare you do that? And he tortured Bilal. And Bilal, uh, he would do something that is very strange. It's very, it's very unusual uh, for Bilal what his actions were in response to this, to being tortured for his faith, for being Muslim, the fact that he was taken advantage of for being a slave. He uh, he instigated, he, he poked at Umayyah bin Khalaf more. He would say, Ahad and Ahad. You know, one is one. God is one, essentially. One is one. Ahad and Ahad. And that would infuriate, and he would torture him more. And he said, bring it on. This is, this is the strength of character. This is the strength of will. Iman, true Iman gives a person, by the way. This is the true strength of character that is given to you. And so, Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu, the companion of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, somebody who wasn't a slave, went to go free Bilal. So he says, you know, sell him to me, give me your price. He says that to Umayyah bin Khalaf. And so um, they they bargain. He's able to buy Bilal, and he says to once the deal is done, Umayyah says to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq, radiallahu anhu. He says, you know, I would have, you know, given to him if you even offered uh, an ounce of gold, like, as, you know, something very, very small. And he says, I would have bought him even if you asked a hundred ounces. Because to him, he looked at Bilal as a Muslim, not as a slave, not as a black man. He looked at him as a Muslim, as a brother that he wanted to save. And this is why the companions of Prophet Muhammad وسلم, would say Abu Bakr is our master and he emancipated our master meaning Bilal that's what they refer Abu Bakr is our master and he emancipated he freed our master Bilal and when the Muslims fought for the first time the battle of Furqan the battle between Haq and Batil the battle of Badr the slogan they chose was the screams of Bilal, the call of Bilal, Ahad and Ahad. That was their slogan in the battle. Now, Bilal, this warmth, this societal change that he felt, this true brotherhood that he felt, he didn't suffer PTSD afterwards. He wouldn't say that I, you know, I'm suffering from the torture that I used to endure. No, it was like, it, 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 it was uh, a cleansing. It was a, his, his practice of Islam, his, uh, his, his, the, the brotherhood that he was surrounded with. He didn't pass that trauma on. Those uh, practices of jahiliyyah were not inherited. The system changed because the hearts changed. Look at the last khutbah of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu A portion of it reads as such. All mankind is from Adam and Eve. Uh, an Arab is no superiority over a non-Arab. Or a non-Arab has any superiority over an Arab. Also a white has no superiority over black. Nor does black have any superiority over white. Except by piety and good action. We've been talking about the main thing that differentiates you learn that every muslim is a brother to every muslim and that the muslims constitute one brotherhood nothing shall be legitimate to a muslim which belongs to a fellow muslim unless it was given freely willingly do not therefore do injustice to yourselves the last khutbah the last sermon that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, gave. Talked about harmony. Imagine if our 
country, our nations, actually practice just this portion, just this portion of the last advice of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what type of harmony would we have? Would we have a young man by the name of Ahmad Arbery gunned down while he was just trying to jog in the streets where everyone is supposed to be free? You know, uh, Ibn Umar, he had a dream and he, and he said, I saw in my dream many black sheep gathering together with white ones. And so uh, he asked the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi what is the interpretation of this dream? He says, non-Arabs will share in your deen, okay, and your lineage. This is what he's saying. It's like, don't think that just because in the Arabian Peninsula, that's why Islam is a universal message. Islam is a universal message for those people who try to say that Islam is just for the Arabs. From day one, it was established that Islam is a universal message. It's a universal guidance. Because, you know, like this tribalistic reasons why we're at odds with one another. We use these superficial metrics when we don't look at the wisdom of why we look different. Why are we different? Why is our people white and black and brown and yellow and red? Why are we so many different colors? Why do we are, you know, people come from all, all sorts of different backgrounds? Okay. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us why. We have created you in Surah the Hujrat, ayah 13, from male and female and made you people and tribes so that you may know one another. Indeed, the most noble of you in the sight of Allah is the most righteous, okay? So that you may know one another. You get to know, like we look, look, we 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 look, uh, we look different, okay? Uh, in another hadith, uh, Rasulullah he tells us, Allah created Adam from a scoop of soil of earth that was taken from all parts of the earth. The sons of Adam come from forth bearing the marks of that soil from various sources. Some of them are red skin, some of them are white skin, some of them black and yellow. And some of them are good natured and some of them are evil. So your skin color is, is not indicative of whether you are good or evil. We're all different in color. We're all different in our appearance. But it is your hearts and your actions that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala looks at. So there's really one solution because we do have racism, we do have tribalism in our Muslim countries. We do have that. Okay. And uh, the only way we as Muslims can come together and humanity can come together is if we turn to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala alone in worship. And we accept uh, and subjugate our ego. We submit our ego to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Think about, think about what the true implementation of Islam was able to achieve. You had all these tribes that were at war with each other for years and years, for centuries. And Allah Subhanahu wa Taala brought them together. Think about how the Khilafah during the Khilafah Rashidun, how it brought so many people, diverse um, ethnicities, races, colors. Doesn't matter if you're a black. There were some of the scholar, greatest scholars were black. Some of the greatest scholars were Arab. Some of the greatest scholars were Persian. From all over uh, the the world, they came together as one. How? No, no amount of marketing can do that. No amount of like superficial laws can do that. No matter how much money you pour at that problem will be able to bring the vast amount of hearts together as Allah was able to do. And that's why Allah SWT tells us in Surah Al-Anfal, Ayah 63, and he has united their hearts. 
if you had spent all that is in the earth, you could have not united their hearts, but Allah united them. Certainly, he is almighty, all wise. Allah did it. Go to Hajj. The greatest example is Hajj. You tell me anywhere in the world where you have this diverse group of people being able to congregate and live together just wearing white sheets and uh, go through all these actions and travel and endure all the hardships of the beating down of the sun and uh, scarcity, scarcity of resources because that's also given as a reason why we're at odds with one another is just scarcity of resources. No. Look at the scarcity of resources, yet they're not fighting how it brought these hearts together. It was Islam that did that. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from the diary of Malcolm X. And I, it's a good companion book to have with um, Alex Haley's biography on Malcolm X. But I'm going to I'm going to leave you a, a quote from Malcolm X to show you the power of Islam. Of course, Hajj is one of the pillars of Islam. The power of overcoming racism. The power of establishing justice by believing in Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala. So he, here uh, in this part of the diary, uh, Malcolm X has completed Hajj in Mecca and he's gone to Medina. Okay. And so this is uh, his words. I remember when about 20 of us were sitting in the huge tent on Mount Arafah. And they asked me about the Hajj thus far had impressed me the most. My answer was not the one they expected, but drove home the point. The brotherhood. People of all races, colors from all over the world coming together as one. Which proved to me the power of one God. And then he ends this paragraph by saying, this also gave me an opening to preach to them a quick sermon on American racism and its evils. This was Malcolm X, 1964. The power of believing in one God, the power of La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, will help us establish justice on this earth. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to allow us to follow his guidance and so that we may be able to bring goodness uh, to everyone and we can establish justice and we can uh, overcome these types of ills of racism, uh, this, these diseases that ravage our hearts uh, so that it can be clean and pure and directed to its creator once again. I thank all of you. Uh, inshallah, we'll see you all tomorrow uh, at our next podcast. Uh, and we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Quick with us, Abdullah Hakim Quick. And so that's going to be an inshallah an excellent episode. We look forward to seeing all of you uh, that particular episode. Remember, always we want to live by the haq, die by the haq. Just when you think life is stuck, tune in to life haq. Do I feel that the New York police are providing enough protection or do I have to have protection of my own? I look for protection from Allah.